your guy, Tuned In Tony, and I have the Jason Fladlin on the podcast today. Jason Fladlin. Jason Fladlin. One of my favorite entrepreneurs. Jason Fladlin. Hey, Jason Fladlin here, and I want you to be the best at what you do. This guy right here is someone that is very special to me and just with me being in the digital space. When I first got into this space in 2020, one of my mentors told me, you have to get this book right here one too many if you want to be successful in webinars jason flatland is known as the guy who's done over a hundred million dollars in webinar sales he is a number one international best-selling author he's worked with kevin harrington from shark tank he's been featured in uh forbes fox abc and he owns a company called rapid crush so today for all the people who are in this digital space, who are looking to learn more about webinars, this is about to be the ultimate podcast where we break down all the elements of a webinar to psychology and who better to have than the myth, the legend himself, Jason Flatlin. Thanks, Jason, for tuning into the show. Uh, Tony, thank you for having me. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, Jason, I like to, you know, I pre-framed you where people understand who you are, but I like to, you know, we can find all the good stuff online, but I want to know like where it all came from. So like, I like to go back first and then, you know, then we'll get to the good stuff. So like, where are you from? Originally, I'm from a small town called Muscatine, Iowa. Okay. Uh, it's not a very good town. <laughs> <laughs> What's the population count there? Uh, like 23,000 people, which is oh, big for Iowa, yeah. but it's a pretty small town. So you knew everybody, right? Not really. It's actually surprising. Uh, it's a river town because like around on the Mississippi between Illinois and, and Iowa and it's a factory town. So, mm. so many people would be coming in and out working temporary factory jobs and being miserable, as you can imagine, when like 25 percent of the population works in a factory. Mm. A, a lot of drugs, a lot of drug usage uh, takes place in towns like that. And it's it's not a good place to be. Yeah, I had watched a documentary about DuPont when they are like they went to like these small towns and then like everybody pretty much, you know, like worked in a factory and that same type of situation was going on where like the factories pretty much run the town, they're donating to the city. So I could definitely see how that that went. Um, do you ever go back to Iowa? Because you're in L.A. right now, right? That's right. So I, I go back as little as possible. I go yeah. to see my dad and a couple of my old time friends, maybe yeah. once or twice a year. Gotcha. Uh, but other than that, I'm happy. I'm happy out here in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that for sure. And then what took you out of Iowa? Like, what was the change, you know, that made that transition happen? Yeah, it's a good question. So I formed the company Rapid Crush in 2011 with my business partner, uh, Wilson Matos, and he was living out here. OK. Uh, and I stayed in Iowa for the next four years. Mm -hmm. And I was already a millionaire before we even formed the company from previous businesses I had done online. And, you know, became a multi multi-millionaire mm. in Iowa. And I was just like, I should probably move out to where my business partner's at. Uh, exactly. I think we could do better if we're actually in a room together at this point. It seemed like the constraint. Uh, so I moved out here to be closer to him. And then he turns out he moves away from here. <laughs> he moves to Florida. But I fell in love with it, dude. I was like, this is, this is a whole different speed. This is the speed that I like. And there's way more energy going on out here that I can tap into, creative energy. And I can get to anywhere I want in the world pretty quickly uh, out of LA where Iowa, everything's like at least one or more connections. So, And I think there's mountains out here. So I'm like right. hiking in the mountains. And, and in Iowa, it's flat. It's cornfields as far as the eye can see. So it was nice to have some some change in terms of the altitude to be up, able to climb mountains. Gotcha. So was there any like schooling that happened? Like, where did you go from being like in high school at Iowa to like this mm -hmm. whole webinar and rapid crush? Like, what was that in between? So I, I went to Iowa State for a semester and a half. Okay. And I was like, bro, this isn't it. This is not it for me. Uh, I had really good grades too. School always came easy for me, fortunately. Uh, you know, I was an ADHD kid. I didn't know it. I was diagnosed later. So I was always getting in trouble, always disruptive, uh, having issues with authority. Uh, but the schoolwork was really easy to me. Like I, I've, I've always had this blessing where I could figure out 
the system and work the system. So if you're like mm-hmm. these, and this comes in handy as we'll talk about with webinars, yeah. where I'm like, okay, these are the components. This is what the outcome is. This is what they're looking for. So how can I do as little of effort as possible mm-hmm. to get the outcome? I didn't know this thing called the Pareto principle or what's called the 80-20 rule back then. I just intuitively followed it, which is a a few inputs give you a majority of outputs. A few efforts give you a majority of the results, that kind of thing. Uh, so I, I was always good in school, but I had a very rough childhood, man. Uh, my mom was a drug addict. She went to prison for six years. Um, it just, it was pretty crazy. So I was all depressed. I had these panic attacks and I was uh, just struggling, just severely unhappy with my life. So I went to Iowa State to get away from all those drugs and all that, the madness that was where I was at. Uh, but then I was still unhappy because it turns out like it's an inside job. <laughs> it's yeah. not on the outside. It's what's going on in the inside. Yeah. And so I uh, went, came back, uh, tried to figure some stuff out. Didn't really figure anything out. I was playing with music. I'd, I'd done music my whole life. I saw that. Didn't um, you used to rap? I used to rap, man. So I, I, I've been rapping since I was seven years old. Man. I mean, I'm 39 now, so I ain't rapping anymore. Nobody's supposed to hear a 39 year old white man rap. Right, uh, right. So, uh, but back then, I was well, I was trying to get the music career off the ground. So I had these guys that I did some music with, and uh-huh. one of them he went and he, and he and he went on like this tour, and he met up with these Hare Krishnas, and he got interested in the philosophy. Mm-hmm. He brought it back, and I got really interested in it because, I mean, dude. Nobody becomes a monk when they're like, hey, listen, my life is really good. Let me make it better. You become a monk because you're like, my life is so miserable. I got to turn to God. Right. Uh, and, and that's where I was at. So I became nice. a monk for a while. Uh, then the, and this all connects together, I promise, because when I became a monk, that really straightened my head up in my heart. I was like, I want to do some big stuff now. I want to show up with the right spirit. If I'm blessed by the creator, um, let me show how I'm blessed by the creator. Mm. Uh, so I, I, I put every effort and focus that I had into my music when I wasn't, you know, doing the spiritual practices. You know, music was my spiritual practice um, on top of all of that. And I couldn't get it to work, man. I just yeah. everything I did, it was like pushing wet spaghetti up a hill with your nose. I just couldn't make it work no matter how hard I tried. But I got into studying the business mm-hmm. and then I got into studying marketing of music. And then I'm like, damn, this marketing stuff, dude. This is as cool as the music for me. Yeah. And I understand it a lot, a, a lot better. Yeah. Like, you know, I understood some parts of the music, but everything came hard to me there. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I've worked with musicians where they could just, they can channel, man, dude. They're not even creating. They're not even thinking. It's effortless mm-hmm. for them. But for me, it was like 15 hours in front of a piano just to even maybe get something halfway decent. Yeah. Uh, and so I was like, too much effort, even though the passion was there. And with the marketing immediately, I could, going back to those systems, I could see things and pick things up intuitively very quickly. Still didn't make a lot of money with the marketing when I switched over there for the first six months or 12 months. Yeah. Uh, But then it kicked over and then it went really big, really quickly. And so that's the whole like story from how I started where I was to here. Here's where I am now. Got you. So is the music still one of those things? Because I know people like they have something that they start with, but then something else takes over. Does that music still somewhere like even though you don't actively pursue it, does it still hit as like a passion point where you're like there's sometimes like you see something and it, it, a tick starts happening and you're like, oh, man, like that nostalgic moment starts like. Coming oh, back. Dude, I got I just the other week. I don't know why this lyric that I wrote when I was about 15 years old. Yeah. So like 24 years ago, just popped in my head and I started running it back again and started playing with it and be like, man, you could build on this and you could put this here and it could turn it. In. And you, you, you almost modernize it. You're like, that yeah. stuff is dated in one sense. But if we were to bring in some of the, the modern musical elements with it, oh, here's how it could build. And I'm like, dude, put that aside, man. You, it's like, that's not your fight. That's not your war to, to be in. So, but, but that's part of your DNA. So you can't completely yeah. squelch it. But, uh, uh, it's, I, I try not to get into it. Cause if I do, who knows, next thing I know, I'm not going to be making payroll and focusing. I'm not going to be showing up to these podcasts. Cause I'm going to be too busy trying to make some music somewhere. I got that one track mine. Facts, facts. So I guess like even before transitioning, cause this would just be a funny question. No. What are some of Jason Flatland's favorite rappers? 
<laughs> oh, this is good, man. So, so I, I am in the, I'm, I grew up in the Midwest, so I didn't have many influences. I mean, Eminem came later, and he's one of my top five probably. But mm-hmm. I was, I like the East Coast gritty sound, uh, and I like the New York sound specifically. So, like Nas was always one of my favorites. Uh, Notorious B.I.G. was always one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like the conscious rap too when it started to pick up. So, like Most Def was one of my favorites. Uh, probably to this day, Black Star, like that that album, I spun that thing so many times. Uh, but I would just pick it up from anywhere, man. Yeah. I, so like, I, I I like all the sounds again because we had nothing coming out of where we were at. I was like, I, I could be East Coast, I could be West Coast, I could be down South. Uh, you know, I, I mess with Cash Money Records, a Little Wayne, yeah, uh, all of that stuff. Uh, yeah. I'm all about it, man. Nice, nice, nice. So then now let's talk about this. So you you did the music, you did that. People know, you know, like you're, it's all over the place. Like the guy who's done, I've seen 100 million, 200 million from the webinars. What was the first webinar? Like, what, where did it start as being mm-hmm. like, this is something? And a lot of people, too, you could touch on this. Like, um, I kind of work with optimizing people's webinars as far as in like their slides and, and, you know, conjunction with their ads in the funnel. But I noticed like a lot of people when they first go into a webinar, they're seeing the success of their friends around them, right? And then they get into this mindset that, hey, just because I jump on this live camera, I have a 100 to 200 slide PowerPoint presentation people are supposed to purchase. And I usually see a lot of failure at that level. So like, what was your starting point when you got into webinars? Yeah, that's a great question. So, and I think this is important for a lot of people because the sales webinars are the ones that everybody talks about Mm -hmm. where, you know, hey, like we did $57.9 million off a webinar campaign last year. It was insane. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've had so many multi-million dollar webinars. It's it's even hard to count them anymore. So that's what gets talked about. And that's what everybody remembers. Uh, But the first webinar I ever did and what I suggest for a lot of people to do was I did a training webinar first. And here's how it went. I said, hey, listen, I got this new product. I want to create it instead of creating it on my own and then coming to you when it's finished and selling it to you. Uh, let's co-create. What I mean by that is I got this new technology. I've never done it before, but I want to try it. It's called a webinar. And here's the deal. If you'll hop on and indulge me as I figure out how to use it and play with it, uh, I'm going to do a full training. And this training is going to be on time management for uh, internet marketers. That was That's what the product. This is in 2008. Uh, so I said, you, you show up, you go on the full training with me. I'll give you the product for free when it's done. Mm. Uh, otherwise, if you don't show up, I'll sell you the product later for $37. Right. So I'm, I'm anticipating, uh, Tony, that I'm going to get all of these people to show up. Right. Now, I didn't have a huge list back then. I had a couple thousand, but they were all customers. And, mm-hmm. and they, I got a lot of clicks to the, a lot of stuff that I sent out. Hardly anybody showed up. Right. I was like, all right, bet, whatever, man. I, I mean, I, I'm going to train anyway. So I had a mind map back then, these mm-hmm. little you know, mind map things where you just click and expand stuff and collapse stuff. And I thought I had an hour and a half of material. Yeah. Turns out I ended up training for four and a half hours. Mm. Okay, okay. And people loved it, dude. Man. There was only maybe like 50 people on, but they loved it. Nice. Uh, it was insane how good it was mm. and the testimonials came pouring in. So I went back to my list the next day. I was like, you missed it, but I'm going to give you a second chance. It was 37. I'm going to let you buy it for 27 for the next 48 hours. And at that time it was the biggest promotion I ever ran yeah. highest converting promotion. So I learned a lot of lessons for that, but, but the biggest lesson was I first use webinars to create a massive amount of value mm-hmm. to my audience. Right. That's key Mm -hmm. because a lot of people think like whether you're good at selling or not, you got to be transformative with your information. When you go and you speak on a webinar, you got to you got to change somebody so they can't go back to being the same. Uh, So if you don't have that piece, Mm -hmm. it makes the selling so much harder. If you do have that piece, then the selling becomes infinitely easier. So I started with that piece. And in fact, the next webinar that I did after that was fulfillment on a product. So I thought, you know, it was really good to train on a webinar. So I I made this offer. I took this product that I sold for $17 and it was like eight steps. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? People asking me, I want more examples. I want you to go more in depth. I want more interaction on this. So here's my thinking. Um, Let's just take these eight steps and turn them into eight weeks. I'll do a webinar each week on each step. Mm -hmm. So that's eight steps, eight webinars that run about 16 hours a time. Do you want to join this coaching program? It's the same exact product that I already sold you, but we're just going to go in more depth. It's $197. You want to join. 
and it crushed, Mm -hmm. sold it out. People bought like crazy. And that was another great lesson for me. But now I got 16 hours and I'm getting paid Mm -hmm. to use webinars and train for 16 hours. Yeah. And and so I'm like, okay, I'm getting it now. I'm learning how to communicate and use this media, Mm -hmm. not just to try to pull money out of people's pockets, but to impact people and help people. And that's how I got sold on the power of webinars because it was more effective for me to teach and train and coach yeah. than anything else that was out there at the time. Yeah. Uh, so I did, I did a, a, that session. And then the, the first time I actually sold on a webinar was uh, I started doing these, what I call to me classes cool. where, you know, you get together, turns out eight sessions is too many. Mm-hmm. I found six was about the sweet spot or four, four to six, depending on the topic. Yeah. And then on that last session, I would sell them the next E-class. Gotcha. So again, it was like three weeks of training on a webinar, one per week. And then on the fourth week, it was a pitch to the next one. So that's the first time I started selling on webinars. And only after doing that enough times, I probably racked a couple hundred hours up on webinars. Yeah. Did I ever then move the webinar to the front? And what I mean by that is here was the pitch. And this is an easy pitch. This yeah. is something everybody should consider. Okay. You do one really powerful webinar for free. And at the end, you say, hey, would you like to do six more webinars like this? Mm -hmm. Go here and sign up. So you give them an example of what it's like to be on your webinars. And then you sell them six more webinars that they have to pay for. And that's the easiest sell of all to make. Mm. You demonstrate the value with the media that you then sell. And so I did that next. And so people were like, whoa, one free webinar was powerful, but it wasn't enough. This topic has too much depth. We need more webinars. And would I, w- would I be willing to pay like, you know, $297 or $497 to get six more of these mm-hmm. and put it all together? Right. So it's, you know, it's that whole free sample kind of a thing. Gotcha. And, and that's where, that's where I really got good gotcha. selling a webinar that's that using a webinar to sell a series of webinars, essentially. I mean, that definitely makes sense too. So a uh, uh, element of selling on webinars that I wanted to bring up. So you're saying like you were on there for four hours and all this amount of time, where is the sweet balance? Because webinars are all about psychology. So when the, the key thing to inspire and not educate, right? Because they say like, if you over educate, and I think you had talked, you had talked yeah. about this in the book, people leave and they're saying, amazing class, you taught me so much, but they're not converting into sales. So how do you feel about that term yeah. inspire, not educate? Yeah, that's a great question. The way I, the way I frame it is inform or no, don't merely inform, transform. Mm-hmm. So don't seek to inform, seek to transform. So there will be education. Yeah. Uh, we want both inspiration and education. Inspiration for its own sake is not very good. If you motivate an idiot, you just got a motivated idiot, you know? Uh, and so you have to educate, but too much education is worse than not enough because mm-hmm. you become overwhelmed. So now you don't know what to do and you feel miserable at the same time. Yeah. And so we want to teach the minimum amount of information needed to create the transformation desired. Mm-hmm. So I always think about it like uh, the statue of David. Yeah. And I think the statue of David is the single greatest piece of art that has ever been created. Mm-hmm. And when the statue of Mac- Michelangelo made it, and when he made it, he didn't say, what am I going to add to this? Mm-hmm. What he said is I got a block mm-hmm. What do I take away from this Mm -hmm. in order to have a masterpiece? Subtraction versus addition. And so when I'm always looking at creating a webinar, it's always like, what is all of the the non-essential information and contradictive education that's out there that I can remove? So what's left is so crystal clear and obvious that it would be impossible to mess it up. And that's what I focus on. Uh, That's how I try to... Uh, steer the content portion of the webinar. And then, and this is very important, attaching the emotional states to the various uh, parts of the webinar. So if I'm, if I'm showing this right now, what's the most likely emotional state somebody's going to feel? Exactly. And then and so if you think about it is if, if you're, if you're throwing a whole bunch of different concepts at somebody one after another, mm-hmm. the emotional state that they're likely to feel is overwhelm or confusion. Exactly. And that's not useful. In your book, that's not helpful. Yeah, in your book, you even talked yeah. about how that was a disservice, actually, because you have felt like at one point it was like, oh, I need to teach them so much. And then you noticed that you weren't even getting the same results out of them and that you were actually doing them a disservice by over educating them, which was complicating, complement, complement their mind and confusing them. You know what I mean? So, yep. 
Oh yeah, it would be better if I just shut up and didn't say a <laughs> word in that instance, yeah. right? Because now I wouldn't give them even more ways to screw something up. Uh, and that's a that's a very important point. Uh, and so to me, it always ends up with when I say transformation is I want to take somebody who's limited and empower them so they're no longer limited. Mm -hmm. And so what is the excuse they hold on to that now right now that keeps them small? And how can I get that excuse away from them so they're no longer held down by it? If I can remove that limitation, growth will automatically occur as a byproduct. And so when I'm designing webinars, I'm trying to figure out if I can just remove all the ways in which they stop themselves from moving forward, they will automatically move forward. And so what do we need to do in order to make that happen? How do we create a paradigm shift so somebody can't go back to the old way of doing things, the limiting way of doing things? Einstein said it best. He says, you can't solve the problem with the consciousness that created it. Right. So they're in problem mode and they have a consciousness that's limited them. And I have to create a new consciousness to create the solution. And so that's that's ultimately what I do in a webinar format. Now, if, if you don't understand anything I just said there, that's OK. You don't have to. Uh, I can just give you procedure and technique. And as as a byproduct, you'll get some of that into your webinars yeah. as well. But if we're looking at the DNA of why I am considered the goat of webinars, mm -hmm. it's primarily for the reason that I just described to you right there is I transform. I don't inform because this is my definition of learning. Tony is. If your behavior doesn't change, yeah. you didn't learn anything. So if you sat on a webinar, say you wanted to lose weight and you sat on a webinar that taught you all sorts of facts about nutrition and all sorts of different uh, mechanisms and biology and this and that, and then you kept eating the same way, you didn't learn anything, period. So I'm like, I would rather you not even know why you're no longer craving sweets anymore and eating more whole foods and just doing that. So if I can design that situation where you don't even consciously, you're not even aware why you don't want to eat this anymore and you want to eat that instead, that sounds good to me because that's the result that I'm after and the result needs a behavioral change. And so all webinars are designed to change a limiting behavior into one that is empowering. Got you, got you. And then like with uh, just the people that I'm around, they're all doing webinars from five figures all the way to eight figures. The common denominator between... Um, pretty much like just building the webinars is just the psychology. Like I hear you got Russell psychology, you got Jason psychology. That's what always comes up to me. And I know that you actually started this a long time ago. So like, where did the whole framework of building a webinar come from? Because right now, me as an optimizer, I'm always either looking between, I'm pulling from both. You know what I'm saying? But if you guys yep. being the ones that started it, especially you, like, where did you figure out how to? And I trained Russell. That's yeah. what I heard. So yeah. if you got his, uh, if you got my stuff, you exactly. got his stuff. <laughs> and, and before you say that, what's crazy is let me get these real quick. I always tell a beginner, I'm like, here, this little cheesy book right here off of Amazon, this kind of just gives you like knowledge because most people, it's too technical for them, right? At the beginning. So they get yep. this. Then I say, this is a little bit more storybookish right here, the expert secrets. Mm -hmm. But once you get it, this is what's going to give you the war weapons, the strategies and the tactics. One too many right here. So where did you figure out how to put a framework of a webinar together? Yep. It's a great question. So unlike a lot of other, almost probably everybody else who teaches webinars, I didn't have anybody to yeah. learn it from. Uh, I had to make it up as I went along, which was my secret weapon. Uh, I had wanted to do. I had wanted to do webinars before I did them, but I knew the technology wasn't stable enough at the time, and the internet connections weren't fast right. enough. So I was just biding my time. But you got to keep in mind, like I started making money at the end of 2007. I started doing webinars in 2008, so I wasn't that far removed from being a broke failure. Uh, I my success had just came briefly, and was still fresh like a coat of paint. So a lot of the guys at the time that were doing webinars a little bit ahead of me, they didn't have a system. What they did instead was they relied on their past successes. So they were either platform sellers, meaning that they would do in-person seminars and sell from mm -hmm. stage, uh, or they were teleseminar specialists because teleseminars were popping yeah. back then. Uh, so what they would do is they would take their frameworks from teleseminars or from speaking on the stage, and they would try to like square peg into round hole, cram them into a mm -hmm. webinar. Uh, I, I think about this like this, like when Ford and Chevy decided, hey, maybe we should create some uh, electric vehicles. Yeah. Uh, they did it from the perspective of we're automakers and we know this because of our history and we're going to force 
the electric car through that paradigm. But they're not the leaders. Tesla is the leader. Tesla was not a car company. Tesla came in with a blank sheet of paper and says, we don't know anything. Let's figure it all out from scratch. And that's why they became the very best in the world at what they do. Uh, And so that was me with webinars. I didn't have, first of all, nobody knew how to do them back then. And everybody who was doing okay was doing it by borrowing a system from somewhere else and trying to just cram it into Mm -hmm. a webinar. So I started from the ground up and I didn't have any past successes I could draw up on. I didn't have anything. So I was like, well, it's kind of like this. So I didn't Mm -hmm. have anything. Uh, So I just figured it all out from scratch. And I didn't study anybody, not because I'm above that, because I love yeah. studying. There's just nobody yeah. to study. Uh, so I started doing webinars with a mind map. Like yeah. I told you, like, who the hell does that? Nobody. And it's not a good yeah. idea, but at least I figured that out. I didn't have to take your word for it that it wasn't a good idea. I tested mm-hmm. it. But I will tell you more than anything, that first year, here was the aha moment that made all the difference, mm-hmm. Tony. I'm sitting on a webinar one day. And there's about 50-ish people on this webinar still. It started with like 100. I ran out of slides. Uh, I have no formal presentation left. I did my pitch. And there's still 50 people on. I got nothing else to say to them. But they're still chatting in the chat box. So I said, you know what? Let me see if I can figure some stuff out here. Let me see if I can determine if if these people are seemingly interested. Is there anything I can say or do that will get Mm -hmm. them to buy? So I went at it and I played with it for an hour and... Uh, Sure enough, I sold like two units. Now, two units at the time was like 500 bucks. So I'm, but I'm doing the math, dude. Uh, And back then, less so now, but back then, $500 for an hour of work was an absolutely incredibly good deal. I was like, hell yeah, I'll work 500 bucks (laughs) an hour. Uh, So so I'm like, let's just do another hour. I still got like 40 Mm -hmm. people here. Uh, I don't know who's active and who just left it on and then walked away from their computer, but let me let me see if I can shake another sale or two loose. Turns out I could shake another sale loose. And I'm like, okay, I only made a only quote unquote made 250 bucks yeah. this hour, but still a good chunk of money. Uh, and so I'm doing it very uh, on a micro level, just thinking point of sale, make some money, put it in my pocket. What I didn't know, because I ended up doing this for mm-hmm. a whole year. So I'm doing four hour webinars now every single time I go right. live. Cause I got about an hour, hour and a half of material and then I'm going to hang out until people quit right. talking to me. Uh, so I, I went for hours. Um, you know, I was doing at least one webinar a week. So 50, that's 50 a year. If each webinar on average is about four hours, which it was, it's 200 hours per year uh, that I'm live on a webinar. It's, it's frankly way more than that. Cause I was doing more than one yeah. webinar a week. Uh, but I easily, my friend, easily spent hundreds of hours over 12 Mm -hmm. months just talking to prospects in mass who may buy from me not one to one but one to few and then eventually one Mm -hmm. to many and that's where i really started to understand these belief patterns and i really started to understand transformation versus information and I really started to figure out what makes my audience tick and how they need to hear, hear certain things in context. It's not content that matters so much. It's the context of the content. And then I started to figure out work backwards from that. Okay, what do they need to hear before they hear this? Okay, what do they need to hear before they hear that? All the way back to the introduction. And that's how I figured out these frameworks. And then I will tell you, I was also selling a variety of different products. So I was producing and publishing a lot of products. And then I started uh, creating software. So I learned how to sell software, which is different, kind of similar, but different than selling information programs and group coaching programs. And then I started selling other people's products as an Mm -hmm. affiliate where I would design webinars to sell other people's products. So I sold a variety of products, a variety of different types of products in a variety of different industries at a variety of different Mm -hmm. price points. And that's how I really filled in the gaps. And, And then what was left was this just really solid framework, which, which is what I put in the book, a step-by-step framework, which is help more people be successful with webinars than anybody else on the planet. Got you. Got you. And then what was probably like your, your favorite webinar? Cause in the book, you talk a lot about the Amazon and that was mm. probably you as an affiliate, right? Yep. And was that like one of your, like, what, what was the reason for choosing speaking about this certain one after the hundreds of webinars that you've done? Yeah. So that one really was, The one, the reason I chose that for the book was I felt it was most illustrative of the techniques that people could most easily model. Um, I have six or seven frameworks 
I'll call them six and a half because I'm not sure if the, the seventh one is slightly different enough or mostly different enough from the six to, to make it its own framework. I only teach one framework in the book. It's the framework that a majority of people should use in a majority of situations based on your skill set, right? Mm -hmm. But I got webinar frameworks. It requires a higher level of skill set, but in certain instances, it's a better tool for the toolkit to use this framework versus that frameworks. So my favorite webinars, A, they're not the most profitable webinars. Mm -hmm. uh and, and i'll tell you why here in a second and, and b uh the the reason they're so some of my favorite is because of the level of sophistication it took to pull them off mm -hmm. but i knew it wouldn't be as useful to the people that were reading the book as possible but like one of my favorite web webinars of all time it converted average it yeah. was nothing remarkable it was nothing to write home about but a company hired me they brought me in to do their webinar i shouldn't have done it mm -hmm. uh but the but the it was a near and dear topic in, in uh, to my heart. So I made an emotional decision instead of a logical decision. The writing was on the wall. It's like, this is a can't win scenario, man. It's like, I don't care how good you are. You ain't going to sell beef to a vegetarian, you know? Right, right. Um, but I, I came in there and, and I, I converted respectable. Not great, but respectable. Yeah. And I and I told my team, I was like, man, that's probably the best webinar I've ever done. And they're like, are you insane, dude? That didn't make us. We would, we didn't make a damn penny when it was all said and done because we had a rev share uh, agreement and we had an upfront okay. retainer. So we're, they're like, you could do a webinar in your sleep for one of our own products and make a lot more money with a lot less effort. Man. And I'm like, let me tell you why it's the best one because I don't think there's a person alive who could have done even half the conversion that I did. And sure enough, they fired us. Yeah. They went and relaunched the product uh, they, like six months or eight months later. And it was just an utter, absolute miserable flop <laughs> of a failure. And I was like, see, I yeah, told you. I can see My that. mediocre result is actually a legendary result. It's like taking <laughs> a team that was 0-16 last year and making them get to the playoffs. They didn't win it. Nobody will remember them, but you turned around an 0-16 team. Uh, so, and that's... That's one of my re that's one of my favorite webinars. Another one is as we do these back end webinars, and this is why they're so wholly um, unuseful to a majority of readers. Is uh, you know I would design webinars that only a few hundred people would ever attend. But mm -hmm. like so, you had to own Product A already, and then you had to join the the membership site that was attached to it and be an active member in that membership site. And then and only then could you come to this webinar that we would do two times a year. And we would sell a $12,000 piece of software on that webinar. And we could only distribute 300 copies of that software at any given time because uh, it was such an overwhelming advantage for what it was that it would it would disrupt the market if too many people had it, their hands on it. Mm -hmm. So I knew every single time I did that webinar within 30 to 40 minutes, we would sell $12,000 uh, to 300 people. Mm. Okay. That's a three million dollar webinar. Yeah. In the span of an hour, hour and a half, mm. cash, net profit, not splitting it with anybody because that's just purely back back in. Uh, and it's a very specific webinar. Again, it's a it's a use case that almost nobody would find themselves in. And if they did, it's it's super sophisticated. Uh, those, so those are the kind of webinars I really like. But I ain't teaching those. Not because I I got anything to hide. I don't care. I'd love to teach those kind of webinars. It's just when you have to calculate if i'm going to write a book and my goal is to to make a hundred multi-millionaires from that book that was my goal uh, it turns out i've surpassed it by the way i uh, underestimated the impact of the book uh it was like what am i going to write that's going to create the most amount of impact for the most amount of individuals where they can improve the least in their own skill set but improve their bank account <laughs> right 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 yeah man. so so what do you when you're on a webinar, what conversion rate do you look at? Because I hear a lot of uh, my webinar mm. friends in the group where and they're like, oh, I'm only converting at a two percent or a three percent. Like what yeah. would be a good number or ballpark that you say people should aim for? You know, I love this question and everybody disagrees with me and fights me on it and doesn't want to accept it. So I'm like, all right, whatever. You don't have to you don't have to agree with me or not. But this is how I measure it. Um, here's the problem with conversion rates. Right. Um, do you want to convert 100% of a $1 product or would you rather convert 1% of a million dollar product? I'm telling you, I'd rather 1% of a million dollar product, right? So, so percentages don't tell very much. Here's the other problem with it. Uh, most of my sales come after the webinar is over. The webinar is just the tent pole in the promotion. So there's a lot of selling that occurs post webinar. Or there's a lot of opportunity at least. So if we're focusing on optimizing point of sale on the webinar itself, we might be harming ourselves long-term. There are certain things that I can do on a webinar 
Or I can put a countdown timer up. So you've got 15 minutes, you know, either buy or this bunny's going to get its head blown off. Right. Uh, and you're going to see very high conversion rates, but then on the replay, you're going to see nothing come in. It's going to be crickets. Uh, so that's not good either. So earnings per attendee, that kind of stuff, conversion on a webinar, that kind of stuff, because there's price point considerations. Yeah, so I always look at it from a campaign perspective. If we're going to run this campaign, this is what we're going to expect in terms of net revenue when the campaign's over. And so that will help me calibrate what role the webinar should play in that. Uh, and And then like, okay, how much of this do we expect when the webinar first hits? ballpark how much should we close at when it's at the end of the webinar campaign the promotion cycle do we do another webinar some of my best campaigns were multiple webinars not one webinar repeated i'm talking two different webinars so webinar number one might have said here are the four steps in order to be successful with this webinar number two might have been let's look at just step four because that's the most important and then webinar three might have been, hey, listen, we don't have time to get into the the details anymore. We just got to figure out if this makes sense for you to buy or not. So three unique webinars in maybe a 12-day campaign. Uh, there's times where those are most useful. So I just simply say, listen, if we're going to run this campaign and we're going to devote this amount of time and resources to it, how much do we re do, should we expect in terms of uh, the ROI? And then we go from there. Uh, so that's how I calculate it. And so it's a very, it's a, it's a very soft number. It's very loose. You can't put it into a box very easily. That's why people don't like it. But I will tell you, dude, so many people make the mistake where they front load sales and then they give up too easily. And they're not realizing that there's so much more money to be made, but they painted themselves into a corner. They're, they're too short term of, of thinkers. Right. But it is very important what you say, because a lot of my friends and clients, they beat themselves up so much by just their conversion rate. And they're just like, I'm about to change my offer. And it's like, yo, you're, you're converting at, you know, a, a 5%, a 3%. And then they're so quick to like change their offer and scrap all the work that they put into it. So, I mean, like you said, that's good to hear for people because now they can see that like, if you look at it over a campaign, look at it on a, a monthly level versus just each Sunday or each Thursday, you know what I'm saying? Then you can probably probably get more more out of it versus quitting so quick you know what i mean that's exactly right yep yep so then the next question that i had for you as well was like you said with your webinars being at you know 50 people when you first started i feel like this new generation of webinars it's very much so based on like how much their ad spend is and they're spending so much money on facebook fifty thousand eighty hundred thousand dollars a week where where is your take on on that? You know what I mean? Like, how do you feel? How are you getting traffic? Let's just go into the traffic mm. section. Yeah, so we need to start spending money on traffic because we haven't spent any money on traffic in like the last decade. Not not seriously. Uh, all of our traffic comes from affiliates. Mm -hmm. And what happens is you get a reputation where it's like, oh, Flatland's going to convert really high and make us all a lot of money. So I, let me send my traffic to him and then, you know, He'll just pay me a commission. So in the affiliate world, typically most products, like a lot of our products, we pay affiliates 40% commission on. So if I'm selling a $3,500 product on a webinar like we did last year, it's like affiliates are making a good chunk of money on that um, per sale. So they're making, I don't know what's that, what that is, like $1,400 a sell or something like that. So they're like, all right, if Flatland's doing this webinar, I'm gonna send my traffic to it. He's gonna track it. And if I make, if I refer any sales, he's gonna pay me for those referrals. So that's where most of our traffic comes from. And then word of uh, word of mouth referrals, some organic ways of people get on the list because they buy the book, stuff like that. Uh, they see me speak, those kind of things. But a majority, 95 plus percent of the traffic comes from affiliates. Uh, and that's a there's not a, a better or worse scenario. It's just a different scenario. Uh, the downside is it's hard to scale a business with affiliates because you're at the mercy of somebody else deciding to send you traffic or not. It's episodic. Uh, it's unpredictable uh, on and on and on. But the grass is never greener on the other side. So on the pay traffic side, I like a lot of those businesses. The businesses that have made the most money with what I've done have figured out how to do pay traffic consistently. Mm -hmm. uh, th there's no doubt about it. And, and I always am like, yeah, that makes sense. Cause like you, you let me break my neck figuring out the webinar stuff and now I'm too exhausted to figure anything else out. Right. Yeah. And you're like, 
thank you. Right, and right. then you come <laughs> in and you figure out the pay traffic side. I'm like, I'm glad though, because there's so many people being successful. But like, if we could spend a hundred thousand dollars a week and, and break even on that, I would do that every single day of the week. Yeah. Um, because now I got a customer and I could do all sorts of damage. Yeah. If I got an existing customer, I, I'm really good at getting people to do business with me over and over and over again. Because I always just make better deals than the money that it costs to get the deal. It's really a simple equation. Uh, and so as long as you are focusing on the right metrics, that can make sense. One thing you should be very cautious of, though, is what I call the hole in the bucket. Mm -hmm. And that's if I got a hole in my bucket and I'm pouring $100,000 through it, some of that money's falling out the bottom of the bucket. So before yeah. we get caught up in vanity, we're like, oh, I put X number of people on the webinar or I spent Y number of dollars or, you know, and, and net and gross are two different things. Yeah. Like you might be grossing 5 million, but you might be netting less than a half of a million. Yeah. It's like before we go too crazy on spending money and making Facebook richer and making Google richer, let's sit down a second and just make sure that we're getting as much out of this as we possibly can. So it's a balancing act. We want to increase the flow of customers, but we also want to do more with the existing customers that we, we have coming in. And I'm telling you, most people, they are getting way less out of their customers than they could be because they're too focused on getting a new customer at the expense of better serving existing customers, mm. which would ultimately make them far more money. Exactly. So are you big on like doing the uh, back end high ticket sales after they come through on a front end offer? I'm not against it. We just don't do it. Yeah. Um, it's it's really funny because it goes kind of goes back to earlier where it's like Tesla can do stuff because they're not entrenched in the old way of doing things. Yeah. Uh, like we're really good at webinars. So we, we get money in ways that you shouldn't be able to. Right. Meaning without the phone room, without having a Slack adjuster, as it's called, where you have like a $25,000 product on the back end, uh, what have you. I don't have a phone room. I don't have a high ticket anything other than to to super successful businesses. We're tossing the idea around of starting a high ticket mastermind for webinars. I'm getting drug into it because I, I was not even my idea. Uh, but in terms of like a regular customer, I don't have a, 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 a expensive thing I could sell you like a fifteen thousand or a twenty thousand dollar thing. I don't have a phone team that could close you one on one on a follow up or on an upsell or on a cross sell. Uh, I think those are great. Yeah, generally you need those in order to pay for traffic because you can't make enough off the front end to make the traffic work for a lot of these offers. Yeah. Big, I'm, I'm talking offers in big niches, right? Yeah. You can get in these, these, these small niches uh, where you could be the big fish in the small pond and you could do a million or two a year in those and you don't have to have anything else other than just that, that preeminence of owning that space, but you're capped. You yeah. ain't doing a hundred million in those places. Uh, and so I like the idea. We haven't got there yet. <laughs> <laughs> We're we're working on it though. I mean, it just goes to show you there's always room for improvement no matter where you're at or who you are. Right. But how many people are usually in today's webinars that you're having? Uh the numbers are pretty steady. They're not uh it's not growing, mm -hmm. which uh, I don't expect it to. It's kind of a thing that waxes and wanes. Uh there's always going to be new media syndrome as I call it. Mm -hmm. Right now the new media is TikTok. Yeah. Uh what will it be next year? I don't know. Uh, two years from now, what will it be? Something that doesn't even exist today, probably, right? Yeah. New media is great because you can do things that normally wouldn't work and they'll work unbelievably well because it's fresh, it's new, it's exciting, and it's different. Right. But it's temporary. Right. And that's really important for people to understand. Webinars will, it'll take another COVID like situation before webinars get as hot as they were a year or two ago. Now they're not hot anymore, quote unquote. When I first started doing webinars, they weren't hot because nobody knew what the hell they were. Then yeah. they got really hot and then they cooled off again, right? So if you have to rely on media to be hot in order to make it work, you don't got a business, my friend. You got a prayer and that prayer <laughs> might not come true long term, you know? Yeah. And so it's another day at the office. Webinars, they, they do okay. In terms of show rate and attendance, people understand them and they, they realize what they actually are. So we don't have to sneak up on them and pretend it's something else, which yeah. I find fine. Uh, and we just chug along and we get so much out of it, though. And I'll tell you why. Because you got to look at what we're doing here. We are simultaneously educating and empowering somebody and selling them in the same sitting. 
Right. So generally what you do is you either train somebody and then you sell them later, which is not that efficient, right? Or you sell somebody up front and you train them later, which is more effective for making money, but it's annoying. Like nobody gets excited to see advertising. They're like, cool, I hope I get another commercial when I'm watching the game. Like nobody wants that. Thing. Yeah. And so most advertising is not valuable in and of itself. It's annoying. It only becomes valuable if you respond to it by the product and the product was a good deal for you. Uh, the webinar is the ability to be a piece of advertisement that is valuable mm -hmm. in and of itself, regardless of whether you purchase or not. So it's it's a very powerful uh, vehicle and it allows you to sell in mass a higher price product that normally you would need multiple touch points and multiple multiple follow up sequences in order to sell. So it's just unbelievably hyper efficient. And it's pro customer, not pro advertiser. It puts the value first, uh, the focus on value first, and then on sale second. And what I'm and so is it ever going to get in? Is it going to get any better than it has been? Probably not. Yeah. But I'll tell you, we we hold the record right now, the biggest launch in the internet marketing space and the biggest affiliate promotion in the space. And we did it with webinars. Yeah. So I don't think that's an accident, right? I mean, I think too, like, um, jump throwing Russell in for a quick second. One thing that he did say that I do think is true. He was like, the best way to start a new business is by webinars. And the reason why I think that yep. some people could be like, oh, I'm not spending all that money, et cetera, et cetera. But it's the fact of, like you said, you're training people in mass, right? So the fact that you know, when you first meet somebody and if I asked you for something off of the jump, you're probably going to say no, because I haven't warmed you up. The webinar is the best place to show social proof, build authority, you know, warm your audience. So, you know, I wholeheartedly agree with what you just said with, you know, working in masses for sure. It's no more efficient vehicle that's out there. That's that's more effective than a webinar. Yeah. So how important to you, Jason, is like, what's the most important part? Like you've got funnel and a lot of people spend time on funnels, right? But then you've got slides and you're always changing your slides. You're always sharpening them up, trying to make them better. Like how important are they between the two in your eyes since you're the webinar goat? Yeah, I mean, neither one's that important, to be honest with you. It's all about the presentation and, and the presentation can be shown on slides, of course. But the meat of the presentation is what's the message that you're conveying that is transformative? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I want when I try to create webinars, what I try to do, I don't always do it, but this is the goal that I shoot for is I want somebody when they hear me speak on that topic, say, man, I've heard a 100 other people talk about that exact same topic for a hundred hours and I've paid them hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. and all of them combined. None of them have given me an aha moment as great as the one that I just got on this webinar. Exactly. That's, the goal. that's exactly. the goal. So, so the slides don't matter until we have that. The funnel doesn't matter until we have that. Once we have that, I don't even need a slide deck. So I just got mm -hmm. back from webinar con, which is uh, the, the biggest industry event, for webinar people. And I was the speaker there and I got a standing ovation. I was the only one that got a standing ovation there. <laughs> uh, and I didn't have slides. Yeah. I had a flip chart. And I think I only wrote on like three things of that flip chart, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I reached into the soul of that audience and I touched them there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I could have sold, you know, I was just on a call uh, with Neo Davis this morning, right? Yeah. Uh, Neo, shout, shout out, out to him. him. Yeah, he's, <laughs> a, he's a pro, dude. Yeah, uh, and he was like, "Dude, you could have." He's like, "If you were selling something at the end, because he was in the audience, everybody would have bought." <laughs> he was like, "You would have closed the lights out, dude." And yeah. I'm like, "I know, right?" Because yeah. you change somebody mm -hmm. when you speak to them. If you can, if you can, if you can, yeah, speak correctly to them, and it's the right person. Yeah. So a lot of this too is making sure the message matches the audience. Mm -hmm. um, so you got to be hyper tuned in to the very specific audience that you're talking to to make this happen. So some of this is technique, but a lot of this is research. Uh, if you do that, then the rest of it becomes inconsequential. So we always start there first. This is why we launch almost everything in beta. Yeah. Where it's like what I call the brown paper bag. It's like we don't got the packaging ready. But if, if, if I gave you the Mona Lisa and I put it in a brown paper bag and slid it across the table to you, Mm -hmm. it's still the Mona Lisa, right? Yeah, it's still the Mona Lisa. It's not hanging in the art museum. It doesn't have the lighting. It doesn't have all the, the pomp that's associated with it. 
Uh, it's in a brown paper bag, but it's still the Mona Lisa. Yeah. And so that's what we're starting at. We're like, how do we put this in front of an audience to find out if we've got the Mona Lisa or not? Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, let's figure that out first. And then once yeah. we do that, so I'm going to blitz out slides. They're not going to be that pretty. They're not going to be that fancy. My funnel is going to have holes in it. It's not going to be fully optimized. It's going to be barely optimized. Yeah. Sometimes it's not even really a funnel. It's just like an order form. And that's the end of it. Yeah. And so we're like on a test audience will this resonate yeah if it does then we start adding to it if it doesn't nothing else matters we either got to figure out a way to make it resonate or we got to move on yeah exactly so what would you say someone who's at a plateau right now maybe they're at 30 40 thousand they they their first webinar when they had all their authority they were hitting seventy thousand a week and now yeah they're just punching themselves, changing every part of their slides every single week. Is it the slides or is it the values not coming through their offer? You know, it could be a lot of things. Yeah, uh, it could be this. It could be that there are uh, updates they need to make. So right now they're they've become irrelevant over time. Markets are dynamic. They always change. Mm. If you don't change with them, it cuts you twice because now you're out of step with your market. And because you're in marketing, the perception is your old news. Right. So you got to you got to stay lock, stock, and barrel with the market. Otherwise, you will be discounted automatically. That's one of the reasons. Another reason is fatigue. Uh, people just get tired of hearing the same angles over and over again. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter how legit those angles are. Yeah. If people just keep hearing it over and over again, they're going to start to habituate, and when they habituate. They go into autopilot and it's they just don't hear you anymore. One ear and out the other. And by the way, this is how success can be the ultimate failure. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had to quit using closes that I invented and pioneered that used to crush it. Yeah. Because people like Russell put them in his book. Right. Uh, and, and he quoted <laughs> me on them. Right. Yeah. And then uh, and then a million people bought that book. Mm -hmm. And then they all started using the closes. Yeah. I couldn't use them anymore. It's, it's like when the audience can almost guess what the next word is that you're going to say, mm -hmm. it's time to switch it up. You know, it's yeah. like, you can't keep putting out the same album every year for musicians. That's the uh, thing that so, I so don't like. Really successful. Right. People right. Will copy. Exactly. So, so it could possibly be that now when you started, it was you and the audience and that was it. But then when everybody heard about all that money you were making, they, they threw their hat in the ring. They started copying you and they clogged the highway up. So now people are looking at five different offers, not your offer anymore. So and those and there's 150 other things that it could be as well. Right. Mm -hmm. This is why it's really important to be super in tune to your customer needs today, not yesterday. What, what, do, what do they need right now that they're not getting? This is why I'm such a huge fan of live webinars. Because, yeah. again, it goes back to what I was talking to you about earlier. If I'm on a webinar and I got 50 or 100 or 200 people and they're chatting with me, I'm going to keep going at it. Mm -hmm. um, in my mind, I'm like, why are you still here if you haven't bought? Exactly. It doesn't make sense to me. You've been here the whole damn time, right? Yeah. What's your deal? Yeah. Like, well, what's stopping you from buying? And it's a puzzle that I need to know the answer to. So I'm going to ask them, right? Yeah. Uh, I'll do that. I do this with clients all the time. I'll be on a webinar. I'll be like, is there anything I could possibly do or say that would ever get you to buy this product <laughs> ever? Uh -huh. like, and that's a legit question. I ask them and then I find some stuff out. Right. Um, and then I say, okay, well, let's work with that. So on, on the micro level, working with them in the moment, sure. But on a macro level, okay, do we need to be putting more of that stuff into the presentations? Yeah. Uh, should we be putting that stuff more into the invitation to, uh -huh. to the emails, to the, the other things, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Uh, and so it's, I'll tell you, dude, I've never seen passive income in my life in this business. People yeah. talk about it. People act like it exists, dude, but man, you're either innovating or you're dying. Hey, There's no passive bar. Income. That's a bar. <laughs> 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 One thing that you say when you said that too, like you haven't seen passive income, you're either innovating or you're dying. You were saying this on the webinar and then I uh, scrambled across on your book. You're like, so many people are so trying to get to the hundreds that they're always stepping over the fives and the twenties. Break that down. Cause that was my favorite yeah, yeah. bar. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, that's a bar, dude, and it's and it's so true. So, um, 
everybody wants that big win. So the, the example I always give is there's a hundred dollar bill, a 50, a 20, a five and a 10 and a one right in front of you. Which do you pick up? And the mm-hmm. answer is you pick all of them up, every single one of them, man. Mm-hmm. And so like people might say, Oh dude, my YouTube advertising is so much better than my Facebook advertising. I'm getting a three to one on my, my YouTube and I'm only getting a two to one on my Facebook. So I stop my Facebook and I'm like, you son of a gun. Do I got to come <laughs> over there and slap you? You know, it's like, yeah, it's all positive money. Yeah. Just because this, is outperforming that doesn't mean that we stop doing that this is why i don't only do webinars yeah Uh, i do video sales letters i do seminars i sell from the stage right Mm -hmm. uh and this is why we're like man we do need to add the phone into play we need to start doing challenges and some of these other things that exist out there uh this is why we don't only sell high ticket products it's Mm -hmm. the most effective thing to do uh, and this is why we don't only go after new customers or only go after existing customers. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is why we're not only in one market. This is why we don't use only one webinar to sell a product. Sometimes we use two or three webinars is if everybody is picking the low hanging fruit, man, it's going to be gone eventually. So we got to pick all the fruit on the tree, not just the low hanging fruit. Uh, and, and that's where that comes from. And so a lot of people, though, they're missing opportunities that individually maybe aren't a whole lot of money. But if you got 10 or 20 of these little opportunities, not only do they add up to be substantial, but you also get this tipping effect. Um, you become top of mind, most aware in your market. So whenever, when anybody looks anywhere, there you are. And that's what I am with webinars. You can't go anywhere and talk about webinars without my name getting brought up. Uh, And that's simply because I worked, I worked every webinar that I possibly could. Like I said, I was selling this, I was selling that. I was selling high, uh, high prices, low prices, multiple industries. I'm writing a damn book Mm -hmm. on the thing and publishing it out. I got various courses on the subject to different, uh, to different audiences and sub audiences and so on and so forth. Uh, So, and this, again, we were talking about this earlier, right? People want to just close on a webinar. Maybe that's the hundred dollar bills. Yeah. But the follow-ups, man, there's still a lot of $50 bills, dude. Hey, right. Uh, and, if, and if you don't let the people in the club, unless they have $100 in, <laughs> then you don't get the $50 people at all or the $20 people at all. You don't let them all come in. Man. Yeah, we got a party. We'll figure it out. <laughs> so when you said you, do the, you don't just do webinars, what's the success rate that you see between webinar and VSL? Because I know for my clients, when I'm trying to sell them on a webinar package and I could see that they're not ready for the commitment, I'm like, maybe you should start with VSL because yeah. we can still kind of have the same flow. But what's your take on that? I mean, it's going to be hard for a VSL to ever be to webinar. Yeah. Uh, but I can tell you why it might make more sense to do a VSL. And there's a okay. variety of circumstances. Uh, first of all, let's explain the why. Um, you can hire an actor to do a VSL for you. Uh, much easier than you could hire a webinar spokesperson. So that's the first reason is webinars are very challenging. Let's not get it twisted. You got to be a public speaker. And that's the number one fear in the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, You got to also be an educator, a trainer or a coach. Mm -hmm. And that's not easy. And then you also got to be a salesperson. Right. And that's not easy. And then there's a lot more tech around webinars than there is with VSLs. So you got to have technical competency and expertise. Uh, no wonder why it makes so much money. It's a miracle anybody could ever do one successfully, <laughs> right? Right. A VSL, though, you can script every single word of a VSL. Uh, mm-hmm. You could have somebody design every single slide because the best VSLs are not nice looking slides. They're essentially words on a screen. Mm-hmm. And then you can hire somebody in order to do that. They can ghost write in your voice. So even if you're the one reading it, mm-hmm. they're the ones that are writing it. And you got an unlimited number of takes. Got you. So you can sit into the studio and punch in every single line. You could flub every line and redo it two or three or four times. And then in post-production, you could edit that thing together. Um, and so that's why VSLs can make a lot more sense uh, in those instances. And the only downside is you don't do any education whatsoever on a VSL. So you don't need to be an educator. So that crosses that person off. So you can just hire a copywriter. Mm-hmm. You can't just hire a copywriter to do a webinar because they also all. need to know how to teach. Right. They didn't know how to educate and they they only know how to sell right uh, so it, it, that, that that makes sense so there's a lot of products where there's not much education needed so then a vsl makes sense for those as well uh there there are times though, i will tell you switching it up just to switch it up makes sense so if you're doing vsls all the time do a webinar and you'll probably get a massive increase right. simply because 
people are bored with your VSLs and vice versa. If you're doing webinars all the time, switching it up and doing a VSL every so often, you'll get a huge increase. Now, people will always make this mistake. Oh, this works better. So now I'm going to do this instead of that. No, dude. Yeah. <laughs> you got to do both. But when you do this and when you do that, either makes sense based on the product, based on the amount of time you have to devote to the, the project at the time. Or it just depends on what have you been doing lately and let's switch it up so we're not predictable anymore. Uh, those are really the factors that are involved in this. But again, there's very few instances where a VSL is going to objectively outperform a webinar. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot easier to create a VSL than it is to create a webinar. Got you. That definitely makes sense. And do you feel like when you were doing VSLs, was the money drastically different or did you mainly focus on doing high ticket offers when you were doing your VSL? I mean, it, the money was pretty good. Yeah. Um, so I can't I can't hate on the money. Uh, yeah. I just felt like the long term value of the customer wasn't as high. Yeah. So the point of sale money was lower, but not significantly lower. Yeah. Usually. Uh, sometimes it was, but not usually. Mm -hmm. But the lifetime value of the customer, if acquired through a webinar, was significantly higher than acquired through a VSL. Got you. Got you. And I mean, what ultimately is going to empower your customer more? And the answer yeah. is the webinar. And, and an empowered customer is a better customer. Uh, mm -hmm. An empowered customer will spend more money with you because you will empower them to make more money. <laughs> yeah, that, that's Period. a fact. <laughs> So, and even if you're like, well, Jason, I'm not in a make money uh, uh, audience. I don't care. Does your product cost money? Right. Right. Uh, empowering people will produce more. Producers make more money and then they have more money to spend with you. So it, it's still always a good thing. But even if you create people that are just more effective, mm -hmm. they're the people that now are in demand to want more solutions. So like millionaires buy more products because they need more problem solved. Yeah. A millionaire doesn't have less problems. A millionaire has more problems they're better problems yeah but there's more of them and so they're more likely to say well, do you got this do you got that i want to buy this from you i want to buy that from you why haven't you sold this to me yet so yeah. we want to create our future customers today so they could tell us what future products to create tomorrow exactly so talking about a problem when you talked about you know the way that you're done it been doing the webinars kind of been like old school and there's a lot of new tactics coming up you talked about ads and I know for the way that we're running with our clients right now with the webinar homepage, and we're going to talk about that in a second before we let you go. Um, do you, are, are you familiar with like recouping ad money through the bridge sale area? Yeah. Got you. Because I was just thinking that that thinking of that as a way too. because you were like, my funnel's kind of sometimes working, sometimes not. Boom, boom, boom. But I'm, we're seeing yeah. so far that like clients are recouping at least like, you know, 15 to 30 percent of the ad budget going into the webinar because spending totally, all right? that money on traffic, you can almost if you don't do it right, bankrupt yourself by spending 50,000 a week on ads and then just not performing well on stage. So, yeah, I prefer not to do a sell before the webinar mm -hmm. if you can handle it. This is why this is one of the reasons we don't do bay traffic. We're like I'm a hardcore purist in the regard of I don't want to spoil the sale. I want to keep building up the momentum, building up yeah. the hype, getting the excitement going. So if I yeah. if I sell you something before I sell you the thing I want to sell you on the webinar, that does get in the way. Mm -hmm. But reality is if I'm putting money out there and I'm spending money, I got to find a way to do that that scales. And so putting yeah. an offer in front of the webinar uh, can make a lot of sense. And a lot of guys do that. It's just the nature of the game. You have to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and But then you get into this thing, okay, well, now I need a separate funnel for that. Now I need another product to sell there. So the level of complexity also goes up as well. So I'm like, for most of these dudes, I'm like, your, your message ain't strong enough, dude. Yeah. So, yeah. so instead of creating five really weak sales pitches, let's just create one ultra strong sales pitch. And mm -hmm. that will outperform anything else, even if you add them all up. There's yeah. something... There's a lot of nine out of tens out there, man, but there's very rarely ever a 10 out of 10. Yeah. And that 10 out of 10, that one extra point difference makes all the difference. That's when somebody says, oh my God, that's that's a changing of the game. That's not just a webinar. That's not just a presentation anymore. That's where you get that rarefied air. So I say, go after that, man. Yeah. Go after that where somebody, when they're done, they say, oh my God, I feel bad that I didn't pay. Yeah to be part of this. I should have paid you to even be on here, man. Right, right. That makes sense. So 
Um, we want to do a fun exercise with you too, you know what I'm saying, for the people. So since, you know, I uh, run a funnel agency, I always get the question, should my funnel be this way? Should it be this way? Everybody came back from webinar con saying it should, we got to change everything now. We got to do this or whatever, right? So we prepared three options for you to break down if that's cool if we can show them to you. Oh, this is fun. Yeah, yeah so I, I always just want to do it in a podcast. fun. <laughs> so option number one, this is what um, we call the more corporate look right here. Um, one of our clients, he's doing two million a month and he operates off of, can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. Yep, he operates off of a funnel like this. He's very highly focused on headline, not having anything distracting, and all attention going to this button right here. Yep. You know, timeline, here's some authority. Yep. And, we, and we just pulled stuff from your site um, right here, yep. host, and then reviews right there. So what's your take on this before we go Great to knowledge. the next one? Yeah, that's really good. You like it? Yeah, I could elaborate more, uh, but the above the fold, very clean, not a lot going on. More information below the fold if you want it. Obviously, we got to look on it on mobile to really know the difference, but I'm assuming the mobile straight so, so we don't have to sweat it, right? Right, right. Um, we've got a countdown timer, so that, that has some urgency in place. Uh, it's very clear and it's very obvious what somebody needs to do to register, and the form is hidden, so it's not too intimidating. they got to click or tap on that to pop it up to fill out the form. So I do like that. And I like the, the social proof and everything else this is pretty good. Yep. Yep. And I would say the majority of clients that want us to go to this level are at the level where they're doing um, at least 100K a month. They've kind of got out of the mindset of graphics and there's just it's all about psychology. So now let's pull up the second one. I don't think you'll like this one, but this is usually our new client at the beginning you know they're like it's all about me they want to see it but this is usually what people come to me for they want the design they want the spaz and this is kind of what they're paying me 1500 to 2500 dollars for a funnel for so we've got big picture yeah, view uh, i don't thing. like it at all but uh <laughs> i mean i like that that looks that looks slick, but even that stuff, I don't really like it. And I'll tell you why. And this is uh, even the first one it, it suffers from this a little bit, but it's acceptable is if you look too professional, then people are like, are you more concerned with the marketing of the thing that you do or the thing that you do? Yeah. Uh, so people would rather you look clean, but not too over the top. Right. Because then the, the question is like, does he care about me or is he too busy trying to make a nice package to trick me into buying from him? So so clean marketing is great. But like this kind of stuff here is like, all right, dude paid a lot of money. Probably he hired professionals and he's spending all this money to try to impress me. Mm -hmm. Is that smoke and mirrors or is that substance? Right. And so we generally don't get too crazy with the graphics specifically for the reason where we don't want to appear like we're too professional right. because in the idea is like now my guard is up. Uh, but the other, the other reasons for something like this is it's just the legibility is not as easy to read. Exactly. Uh, it's, it's harder to, to read. It's busy. It's, it's somewhat confusing, but if we go back up, uh, let's go back above the fold. Um, uh, the other thing too, is nobody cares about me or you or mm -hmm. anybody. They care about what's in it for them. Yeah. And so that's what that's what matters the most. Now, I do like the button. I like the animation on the button popping up because at least you know what to do. And again, it's got that countdown timer in there. You mm -hmm. know, it's happening. You know, it's popping off again. We'd have to see what that looks like on mobile. I, I should have been I should hide myself so you don't see me when it goes down to mobile because over 50 percent of your traffic is going to be coming in on mobile. Uh, but again, man, it's not that bad. Yeah. Um, if we had to run it, I'd run it. Yep. And then lastly, this is my eight figure. I only have one, but this is eight figure client. And this is what if I created this for a client, they would probably like do a charge back and say, you didn't do any work. But the psychology yeah. of just getting straight to the point is theirs. This is pretty good. Is there anything more to it than this page? That's it. And the psychology okay. with this one is people don't always want to opt in with their phone number. So we ask for the email address first 
and then the next page asks for the phone number. That's right. Yeah. I, I mean, if I had to guess and you never know until you test, but if I said, Hey, we're running a split test, a, B and C, which one's going to make us the most money? Probably this one number is C or letter C I should say here. Yeah. Uh, I do like to put more information on a page than this, not because it will increase conversion because it probably won't. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm thinking longevity. I'm thinking long term. And so getting people into the right state of mind, if we make it too impulsive and too easy for somebody to come to the webinar, they'll bounce out too easy. And then people start to say, oh, my bounce rate is too high and my conversion rate is too low because they don't factor something like this in. Well, you made it too easy to come to the webinar. So naturally, your conversion rates are going to be lower. So they, stay, they take that personal. So they don't know how to calibrate to that. So one of the reasons, because we work with a lot of clients now, we publish them and all that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I intentionally will put more copy on the page, right. knowing that that the opt-in rates will be lower and the show rates will be lower, but the conversion rate will be higher because the lead will be more qualified. Mm -hmm. And so that's some of the reasons why none of this is done in a vacuum, right? All of this is interrelated and connected. Uh, but yeah, if, if I had to guess anyone that would make the most amount of money, it would be this. And yeah. if we're running advertising, if we're spending dollars on it, like we're not guessing, we're testing and we're okay with being wrong if it makes us more money. Yeah. And and then you like yeah. got, you got skills, man. Got <laughs> I appreciate it. And then I'm going to show you one before we get back into the, the conclusion of everything. This was the funnel that I created that literally catapulted my funnel career. It was a themed funnel. Um, shout out to my friend, uh, Justin Phillips. So it was a black. Oh, Justin, yeah. Yeah, I Justin. I love your car. I like <laughs> so this one right here, we created Mission Black Friday themed video. Their webinar had, I think, 20,000 registrants, but... Jesus. There was a lot of hype around it, a lot of hot audience, you know what I mean? But we went we went all the way 110% <laughs> with yep. the graphics in the theme. But now, uh, something like this makes sense. Now again, like I know Justin's very big on on uh, Instagram, right? Mm -hmm. So in the context of Instagram or some of these other social media, there's a certain expectation where where presentation and look and feel uh, and, and the superficiality are making more sense. Most of our traffic comes from email. The context is different there. But there are times when you could design something like what you've done here where it doesn't matter. What matters, uh, the look and feel is less important is you got something to talk about. Mm -hmm. This ain't a normal web page. Right. So people now feel like this is special. They feel like this is different. They feel like this is exciting and it's themed. And that makes it extra special. It's a rarity. You can't do this all the time. You can't, it's like you can't make every sentence in with an exclamation mark. You know, right. you can't bold every word in every sentence. Then nothing is bolded. But if you are judicious when you're bolding and when you're exclamation marking, man, I bet that thing did very, very well. Yeah. I'm going to hit up Justin. I'm like, dude, I, I bet you crushed it recently. I just got this feeling somehow. Something. <laughs> I feel like you just crushed it. Yeah, fact. So I definitely was just glad I could at least show you the funnels because that's a big part of it. You know, it always goes funnels, traffic, slides. And then we already talked about the slides, but I just hate how so many people. But you almost said you kind of contradicted it. I feel like so many people sleep on the slides because they're used to making presentations in college and at work. But I feel like if your slide presentation, like you said, doesn't transform and inform then it's just like the whole, the money spent, the ad budget's blown, all of it's gone. You know what I mean? So, so. I don't know, man. It's just, you can give me the most basic slides and I'll do well. And then after I do well, we'll see if we can incrementally improve it. Half the time we can by adding that jazz to it. Half the time it decreases conversion rate. <laughs> yeah. Facts, facts. Uh, but I'll tell you, it does bring in partners. If you got a better look and feel, more people will want to do business with you. You'll get invited to speak on more stages, right? Uh, you'll get all sorts of other deals that are not directly connected to the funnel itself. Mm -hmm. So so that's an argument for making it look clean. But ultimately, uh, my, my final analysis is whatever gets it done for you, man. If yeah. Whatever it takes for you to show up on that webinar, Mm -hmm. Ready to change people's lives? Well, let's do it. Yeah. For you. 
Yeah. Not necessarily because it, it converts a 0.1% better here or because somebody over there at this place told you you had to do it or because somebody else in your industry is doing it, right? What's going to switch you on? So when you show up, the most of you is there that can be there. Mm -hmm. And that's going to help the audience. The more you are you and the more present you show up, the more you can empower your audience. Mm. And the more customers you'll get, the more you'll get talked about the easier it'll be to build your business. Got you, got you. And I want to talk about your book. But before you get there, when we were, when you were at WebinarCon, did you meet Will Rivera? Uh, I don't I don't remember, man. I met so many people. Yeah, you met so many people. I, I think I met Will, but I can't remember, dude. So here in Atlanta, Will's like our our oracle, our unicorn. Um, a few When I first met him a year ago, a year and a half ago, he was at probably... I don't know, maybe $30,000 a week. And then now, and this was the importance of the customer journey, the lifetime journey. He was literally in the summer at 500,000 a month. Now he's at 2 million a month with the Amazon offer. And he thanks it all to you and tells us all, Jason, 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 or whatever. But See, what- I gotta do a better job of keeping track of these success stories, man. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but mainly what changed for him was the back end offer of, not only selling to a front loaded audience, but giving them complimentary products to hold their hand through the process. Yeah, smart. Yeah. So um, and I know you said we need to add all of that type of stuff. Do you think you could almost become double the success that you already are with adding those key elements of like, you know, extending oh, yeah. the customer journey? Yeah, I mean, for everything I did right, there's more things I've done wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's why every year I'm like, man, there's so much cool stuff that I can learn. There's so much ways which I could be better and help more people. I mean, at the same time, you don't want to get too caught up in chasing things because mm -hmm. that's that's external stuff that's outside of you that's putting you in a position of lack. Like, I got to go get this, meaning I don't have it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm always simultaneously so full within, grateful for what I do have and blessed, truly. Uh, at the same time, it's there's always room for growth, and that's exciting. So I don't ever look at it as like, oh, I don't have this, I need it, right? It's just like, man, uh, there's so much more, more stuff to learn, and that's exciting to me. So I'm always curious, and I'm always fascinated, and that just makes me want to learn, and I'm learning all the time. And mm -hmm. I'm excited, too, because some of the stuff that I've helped other people with, and I've really built some huge brands up that were nothing, like that came years after me and now they're way ahead of me. It's so exciting because now I'm like, okay, I'm learning from them. They learn from me. Now it's my turn to learn from them. What can they teach me? And uh, I, it's never going to stop, man. I mean, the end of the goal is contribution. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how many people can we help? How mm -hmm. can I have the biggest contribution that I can provide to the most amount of people as possible with the biggest amount of impact? And so right. it's like, all right, we got some more work to do, man. Uh, we're contributing and I dig it. And it feels good. And I've been rewarded for that monetarily, financially, and spiritually. Mm. It's a good start, though, man. We got a lot more we got to do. Yeah. <laughs> so what has it been like? Um, oh, yeah, this was on my mind before I get to the book question. One thing I love about you when you're selling and you're on there, you always give very visual um, what would happen if you didn't do this to where it's right below insulting but it hits an emotional part right and what you said one you said something on the tez and shack webinar i forgot but this one was so funny in the book you were like timid salespeople have skinny children and when you really think about that it's like wow you know what i mean so it's like it's just your yeah. psychology of how you could break that down to touch somebody to where they can process like if i'm not selling my family's not eating you know that's right. Uh, yeah. And on Tez's webinar, I said the best thing you can do for the poor is not be one of them. Right. Hey. Uh, <laughs> one of many things that I said, uh, you know, the way I look at it. And so you, you develop these uh, after doing it a couple thousand times. You learn how to speak in pictures and, mm -hmm. and, and speak in ways that really go deep and hit just immediately. Like I got a client once we were I was speaking at a seminar uh, and she was having trouble with her sales team and and and. I, I had asked her, I said, well, what's your goal? She's like, I want to do $10 million next year. And I said to her, I go, uh, does your sales team know that? Mm. And she goes, no. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, do you think it'd be important that they did? She's like, yeah. I go, now that you're hearing yourself say this out loud, doesn't it change things? And she's like, oh, it totally does. Like, yeah. I had to say it to her. No. Now that you're hearing yourself say it out loud, yeah. that really brought it home for her. Because now yeah. that she was saying it, 
that she wanted this thing and that her sales team sucked and and then but she never told him what to do it cut right through all the nonsense and the noise and, yeah. and then she just looked at me and we didn't say anything else i i just saw understanding in her in her eyes and i said you know what to do now don't you and she goes yes yeah. so everybody else in the audience was like what does she need to do? I'm like, teach. And I'm like, I didn't say a damn word. I just, I go, you know what you need to do? And she goes, yep, I know what I need to do. She had the epiphany. I didn't even know, need to know what it was. Yeah. Uh, but learning how to speak in the ways that, that really bring it home. Mm-hmm. That's the difference between those that are super successful and those that just get by. Mm. Cause you got to You got to cut. Like, so, so the way I look at it is there's big stakes here, right? Mm-hmm. There's livelihoods on the line. Yeah. Uh, there is, Somebody could go either way. They could go and be super successful or they could be an absolute failure. So I owe it to them yeah. to let them know what the cost of failure is like, to really, truly know what's on the line. Because, dude, I'll tell you, most people right now, they're sleepwalking through life. Yeah. And they wouldn't be if they knew what was on the line. Mm-hmm. If they truly knew what it cost them to continue to live in mediocrity, they would do something about it. Mm-hmm. But they haven't woken themselves yet up yet, and, and the, the people around them and the things around them haven't woken them up yet. I'm going to try to wake them up. Right. And so sometimes, you know, we can gently say, hey, get out of bed. But other times we got to splash. And, and that's water exactly what that does. <laughs> that's the cold water straight to the face with love and with care and with sincerity, right? Yeah. But it's like, dude, you need to wake up, man. What, what What's going on ain't going to cut it anymore. Like, yeah. All right, you're right. And I know you're a busy man. I don't want to take up too much of your time. But, you know, this book, of course, everyone tells you, Jason, this book changed my life. It did this. It did this. Has this book been life changing for you? Is it more just contribution to the industry? Like, what's it like being a number one international bestselling author? You know, the first three years I put it out, I was like, man, I wasn't really satisfied or happy with it. Uh, And I was just like, I because it didn't sell that much. Yeah. But. I didn't have the audience for it. Mm -hmm. However, people started picking it up and somehow, some way the right people started getting their hands on it. And then I started going to these conferences Mm -hmm. and somebody would just stop me and say, Jason, dude, your book, it made me a million dollars or it made me $3 million or it made me $5 million. Yeah. And you know, that can happen once or twice, but it started happening everywhere I went. Yeah. And I'm like, damn, dude, it's like I, I, I hadn't sold a whole bunch at the time. Now we, we're consistently selling people like Alex Ramosi, man. Every time they they shout me out, I get so many sales and being in his book, yeah. which is selling insane right now. I'm like, dude, every time he sells 10 copies, I sell the copy. You know, it's crazy. <laughs> It's, I'm the most quoted person in his book. Right. Yeah. And it's uh, it, it's in, it's insane. So it took. It took about six years, mm-hmm. but that book has finally had that lift off to where it does hit that tipping point where now it's like everywhere I go. Like I didn't, I, you know, you and I, Tony, I ne- we'd never talked before. I didn't know you come into this podcast today. Yeah. I hop on there and there's my book in the background. And I'm like, gee, yep. uh, this is yep. going to be a good one. Man. <laughs> this is going to be a real good one. Yeah. And, and that's happening now. You know, people like Tez, they get their hands on the book and they tell everybody. And I think somebody told him and, 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 he was one of the many other people that they told as well. And, you know, Justin has the book and all of this. And I'm like, there you go. That's why I wrote it. Yep. I just didn't realize at first it didn't happen hardly at all. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden that's happening at a greater level than I ever thought it could. Yeah. Uh, so I'm like, all right, that that's makes sense. Cause everybody always tells you to write a book. And, and I was like, the book is the least profitable thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> it's the hardest <laughs> amount of work for the least amount of money. Right. Do you- do you have all the copies and your team ships them out? Or is it like, you know, do you have to do all oh, We that? just have Amazon fulfill it. Yeah, I mean, we need to get back on top of it because I laugh because I'm like, I want the hard covers because hard covers are better. But we're like, I don't even mess with that stuff. Yeah. Uh, and again, it just snuck up on us, right? It went like three or four years where I, we did an initial push and it sold really well initially. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then like crickets for years. And all of a sudden it started selling a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here. Uh, but when you write the Bible on the subject, man, eventually people find out uh, yeah. and that's what's happened here. And it's no joke, dude. It's that book was a derivative of a five thousand dollar in-person webinar training that I did. Mm. So we did a, the webinar training. It was the Genius Webinars training and it cost five thousand dollars to be there in person. And it's like a who's who, like big names in the industries showed up and they all paid me. Nobody got in for free. Uh, and And I took the material that I used to create the $5,000 program in person. And I wrote the book off that. The Mm -hmm. book is exactly the same in terms of training as the in-person thing. The only difference is you don't get to see me demonstrate it. 
uh, in front of a live audience. You don't get to see all the extra examples of the thing or whatever. Uh, but I held nothing back. And because it's a framework, it's yeah. designed to be implementable. Because, mm. dude, you can write a book that's not implementable. And a lot of people do. It's a lot of knowledge that's just being thrown at you. You can't sell a $5,000 course unless it's implementable. Otherwise, people are going to be pissed, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's essentially, it's an implementation program in a book format. It's literally like, do this, do that, do this, do that, step by step, exact. And so I got it down to a science like that. And that, so it makes sense. It makes sense that the people who need it, they hear about it, they use it, they can follow along, and they can actually... Uh, get a result with it. So I'm so blessed. Yeah, it's a big deal. I got to write another one, but man, after writing that last one, <laughs> I, was, I, need, I need another couple of years before I'm ready for that again. Have you talked to Alex Hermosi? Because you know, just him, like all his mm-hmm. immense success in the past, what, set five to seven years and how he just quotes you $100 million offers. Like, yeah. like last question, like what's your take on just like you being able to pour into somebody like him? Yeah, I'm so happy to be part of it. Like the dude sees things at several levels deeper than I do. He's probably one of the greatest minds in marketing today, period. Right. Mm -hmm. And I love that because he's able to he's able to discern who's the best at what they do. And systematically, he can break it down and integrate it into something greater. And so I really love that. It's helped me find my role in my place more. It's like I'm never going to be the guy that leads the army. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to be the guy that's in like SEAL Team 6. Like mm-hmm. when you when you need to kill Bin Laden, you call me. I can't work with a whole army. I can't run a whole major business with multiple moving parts, right? Yeah. But when you need the big job done, when it only requ- when, when there's only six people on the planet that you call up to do the thing, I'm one of them guys, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's my skill set. Now I'm learning how to round it out and I'm studying people like him again. Um, but it's just like, all right. That's my skill set. And what really truly is my skill set, it's not even necessarily the webinars. It's going back to speaking with that impact. Because what I said to Alex one day, once upon a time, I walked up to him right when his his gym stuff started hitting. Uh, it just started hitting, like mm-hmm. barely was there. And I could tell him he, uh, he'd been killing himself, him and his wife, to get it over that edge. Yeah. And I, I don't know what possessed me, but I walked up to him unsolicited. And I said, Alex, a lot of people in this position right now, once they finally turn the corner like you have, they want to ease off the gas, right? I go, right. if there's ever any time to double down, it's right now. Yeah. And I said it a little bit better than I said it here. And I don't know, it was just the right time, to uh, right place, said it to him in the right way. And he took that to heart. And he says, uh-huh. life-changing advice. And because I gave him that advice and, and he went and he did it, he was like, who the hell is this guy? So he found <laughs> he found my, my book and he found my product, Genius Webinars. And he says it was the best uh, the best course he's ever bought that taught him off for construction. That's and I'm awesome. like, that's pretty cool. So he sent me a text. He's like, you probably don't even know who I am. And I love that. I read that text every so often. I'm like, OK, <laughs> hey, that's- times have changed, right? Times have changed. <laughs> but that's my goal. And, and I've had other people like him that I've helped as well. And so the thing is, is like we underestimate the true impact of what we can do. Mm-hmm. And it's it's something that you'll say to somebody one time in a chance meeting that seven years later, that person will be selling hundreds of millions of dollars and doing things at a level that you didn't even think was possible for you or for anybody else. Mm-hmm. And you, you can't claim that as yours. You can claim a little bit of that. Uh, and that's good enough. And so yeah. that's the other it, for me, it's important, but also hopefully it inspires uh, other people out there. And you can't put that stuff on a business plan. You can't uh, plan for it from a marketing perspective. But if you're coming out there and saying, I truly want to offer something one of a kind that's unmatchable, Mm -hmm. truly something that is amazing that only I and I alone can create and Mm -hmm. put my heart and soul into it. that's why we do this stuff. Otherwise, what's another million dollars when you have plenty of millions already? Facts. What is it? It's nothing, right? So, mm-hmm. so do it at that level. And by the way, ironically, I love how God sets this stuff up. Mm-hmm. Ironically, that'll make you more millions of dollars. <laughs> facts, facts. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time today, Jason. I know we went over. Um, any everybody, make sure that you check out one too many. Um, we all know that Jason is the webinar go, and I'm sure so many people watch this and get so much knowledge from it. 
what is do you have any lasting sentence two sentence to anybody who's struggling in a webinar in a webinar or they're just getting too comfortable because they're at a level where they think they're killing it what, what would you have to say to them as we end yeah it's who who aren't you serving that if you did serve it would be completely life-changing mm. who's drowning right now begging for somebody to come come along and throw them a life raft Mm. Who is that person? How can you find them and how can you help them? That's the audience that you need to be looking for. Maybe you already have them. Maybe you don't. But man, that's the pursuit. That's what we're always after. Who can we help? Who can we help? Who can we help? Um, mm -hmm. If you do that, you'll always be hungry. You'll always be growing. And you'll always feel good too because you're helping. And yeah. man, that's what the name of the game is about. Connection. Yep. Cool. Well, that's that's the man himself, Jason Flavlin. I will put all your links in the, uh, in the description. Everybody follow Jason. He's now growing immensely, doing his things, getting on this social media game. Get the book, and I will see you all in the next episode. Appreciate you guys. Talk to you later. All right, man. <laughs>